Chapter 5 of The Storybook of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Storybook of Science by Jean Henri Fabre. Translated by Florence Bicknell. Chapter 5 The Sheepfold. In the evening, Uncle Paul resumed the story of the ants. At that hour Jacques was in the habit of going the round of the stables, to see if the oxen were eating their fodder, and if the well-fed lambs were sleeping peacefully beside their mothers. Under the pretense of giving the finishing touches to his wicker basket, Jacques stayed where he was. The real reason was that the ant's cows were on his mind. Uncle Paul related in detail what they had seen in the morning on the elder, how the plant lice let the sugary drops ooze from their tubes, how the ants drank this delicious liquid, and knew how, if necessary, to obtain it by caresses. "'What you are telling us, master,' said Jacques, "'puts warmth into my old veins. I see once more how God takes care of his creatures, he who gives the plant louse to the ant as he gives the cow to man.' "'Yes, my good Jacques,' returned Uncle Paul, "'these things are done to increase our faith in Providence, whose all-seeing eye nothing can escape. To a thoughtful person, the beetle that drinks from the depths of a flower, the tuft of moss that receives the raindrop on the burning tile, bear witness to the divine goodness. To return to my story. If our cows wandered at will in the country, if we were obliged to take troublesome journeys to go and milk them in distant pastures, uncertain whether we should find them or not, it would be hard work for us, and very often impossible. How do we manage, then? We keep them close at hand, in enclosures and in stables. This also is sometimes done by the ants with the plant lice. To avoid tiresome journeys, sometimes useless, they put their herds in a park. Not all have this admirable foresight, however. Besides, if they had, it would be impossible to construct a park large enough for such innumerable cattle and their pasturage. How, for example, could they enclose in walls the willow that we saw this morning with its population of black lice? It is necessary to have conditions that are not beyond the forces available. Given a tuft of grass whose base is covered with a few plant lice, the park is practicable. Ants that have found a little herd plan how to build a sheepfold, a summer chalet, where the plant lice can be enclosed, sheltered from the too bright rays of the sun. They too will stay at the chalet for some time, so as to have the cows within reach, and to milk them at leisure. To this end, they begin by removing a little of the earth at the base of the tuft, so as to uncover the upper part of the root. This exposed part forms a sort of natural frame on which the building can rest. Now grains of damp earth are piled up one by one and shaped into a large vault, which rests on the frame of the roots and surrounds the stem above the point occupied by the plant lice. Openings are made for the service of the sheepfold. The chalet is finished. Its inmates enjoy cool and quiet, with an assured supply of provisions. What more is needed for happiness? The cows are there, very peaceful, at their rack, that is to say, fixed by their stickers to the bark. Without leaving home, the ants can drink to satiety the sweet milk from the tubes. Let us say, then, that the sheepfold made of clay is a building of not much importance, raised with little expense and hastily. One could overturn it by blowing hard. Why lavish such pains on so temporary a shelter? Does the shepherd in the high mountains take more care of his hut of pine branches, which must serve him for one or two months? It is said that ants are not satisfied with enclosing small herds of plant lice found at the base of a tuft of grass, but that they also bring into the sheepfold plant lice encountered at a distance. They thus make a herd for themselves when they do not find one already made. This mark of great foresight would not surprise me, but I dare not certify it, never having had the chance to prove it myself. What I have seen with my own eyes is the sheepfold of the plant lice. If Jules looks carefully, he will find some this summer, when the days are warmest, at the base of various potted plants. "'You may be sure, Uncle,' said Jules, "'I shall look for them. 
I want to see those strange ants' chalets. You have not yet told us why ants gorge themselves so when they have the good luck to find a herd of plant lice. You said those descending the elder with their big stomachs were going to distribute the food in the ant hill. A foraging ant does not fail to regale itself on its own account if the occasion offers, and it is only fair. Before working for others, must one not take care of one's own strength? But as soon as it has fed itself, it thinks of the other hungry ones. Among men, my child, it does not always happen so. There are people who, well fed themselves, think everybody else has dined. They are called egoists. God forbid you ever bearing that sorry name, of which the ant, paltry little creature, would be ashamed. As soon as it is satisfied, then, the ant remembers the hungry ones, and consequently fills the only vessel it has for carrying liquid food home. That is to say, its paunch. Now see it returning, with its swollen stomach. Oh, how it has stuffed, so that others may eat! Miners, carpenters, and all the workers occupied in building the city await it so as to resume their work heartily, for pressing occupations do not permit them to go and seek the plant lice themselves. It meets a carpenter, who for an instant drops his straw. The two ants meet mouth to mouth, as if to kiss. The milk-carrying ant disgorges a tiny little bit of the contents of its paunch, and the other one drinks the drop with avidity. Delicious! Oh, now how courageously it will work! The carpenter goes back to his straw again. The milk-carrier continues his delivery route. Another hungry one is met. Another kiss. Another drop disgorged, and passed from mouth to mouth. And so on with all the ants that present themselves, until the paunch is emptied. The milk-ant then departs to fill up its can again. Now you can imagine that, to feed by the beakful a crowd of workers who cannot go themselves for victuals, one milk-ant is not enough. There must be a host of them. And then, under the ground, in the warm dormitories, there is another population of hungry ones. They are the young ants, the family, the hope of the city. I must tell you that ants, as well as other insects, hatch from an egg, like birds. One day, interposed Emile, I lifted up a stone, and saw a lot of little white grains that the ants hastened to carry away under the ground. Those white grains were eggs, said Uncle Paul, which the ants had brought up from the bottom of their dwelling, to expose them under the stone, to the heat of the sun, and facilitate their hatching. They hurried to descend again when the stone was raised, so as to put them in a safe place, sheltered from danger. On coming out from the egg the ant has not the form that you know. It is a little white worm, without feet, and quite powerless, not even able to move. There are, in an ant hill, thousands of those little worms. Without stop or rest the ants go from one to another, distributing a beakful, so that they begin to grow and change in one day into ants. I leave you to think how much they must work, and how many plant lice must be milked, merely to nurse the little ones that fill the dormitories. End of chapter 5, read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on Wednesday, June 19, 2013, in San Diego, California.